Here we go, the Diz Fairs Disneyland Pirates of the Caribbean episode. The depths of information run pretty deep in this one. That's because the ride is just so rich, filled with talented artists and visionaries, including Walt Disney himself. There's a ton to go over with this iconic attraction, from its sordid beginnings to new technologies of the day, along with a little bit of infighting. And it's all here in one shocking and explosive episode. Strike your colors, you bloomin' cockroaches! So from the earliest planning stages of Disneyland, Walt Disney knew he wanted a pirate attraction. But for one reason or another, it never materialized for the opening in 1955. There was even supposedly concept work by Imagineer Herb Ryman to have a pirate shack along with pirate laundry drying out on a line at the edge of Frontierland. Not seen here, this is just another of Herb Ryman's work for New Orleans Square. However, within two years, in 1957, Walt was back on Pirates again and asked for concept designs and plans for a walkthrough museum to go beneath the first new expansion planned for Disneyland, New Orleans Square. And this was all while work was being done to create Submarine Voyage, the first Disney monorail, and the Matterhorn. Walt was an ambitious, busy guy. Now, whatever came of this preliminary work for Pirates in the 1950s, I have no idea. I scoured everywhere and couldn't find a shred of anything other than this layout plan done by Claude Coates in 1957, and this other one here done in 1960. You can see there was a big ship, a cypress swamp, and a burning city, but I couldn't find who else may have worked on it or any sort of drawings or mock-ups. But whatever the case, in October of 1960, Walt tasked Mark Davis to put together the preliminary work for Pirates of the Caribbean. Walt is quoted by Mark Davis as saying he thought it could be a walkthrough down there. You know, maybe Pirates of the Caribbean, which may have been the first time the attraction was called as much. So Mark Davis got cracking on developing gags, storylines, staging, and interesting scenarios. Now Mark Davis was an all-out genius, a true artist in every sense of the word, as well as practically every artistic medium. And he completely immersed himself in pirate lore, surrounding himself in books and art of the time period. He was kind of sad to realize the unglamorous life of true pirating, though. This ain't no place for a respectable pirate. There weren't many skirmishes or buried treasures. Most, in fact, died of disease or infection. But he gradually realized that this only left more room for fun and thematic interpretations. And this was all Mark Davis did for two years, drawing and conceptualizing pirates. Every so often, sometimes with gaps of months to half a year at a time, Mark said Walt would come in to speak with him about how things were shaping up, never once lifting his head to actually look at Mark's work, which practically covered every square inch of Mark's office, which Mark felt quietly and inwardly maddening. Though he suspected Walt, who was known to often stay late, had frequently reviewed Mark's pirate drawings after everyone had gone home for the night. The enormous amount of work Mark produced during this time, combined with his limitless talent, leaves little room to wonder why Pirates of the Caribbean is as amazing as it is. He really honed in on every aspect of the attraction. The character designs, facial expressions, clothing, background, set design, ship design, architecture, staging, posing, humor, lighting, color palettes, idea after idea after idea. He even took it upon himself to revise the layout. There wasn't a team of people doing all of this. It was just Mark Davis. And the Pirate Project is only one of the reasons I firmly claim that he was the absolute greatest Imagineer of all time. But this isn't another Diz Fair's Mark Davis episode, so I'll move on. So move. While Mark was toiling away, Walt's attention moved on to other entertaining and more easily attainable projects being hammered away at the time. Namely, but not limited to, the 64 New York World's Fair. Now, Walt made four attractions for the World's Fair, if you didn't already know. Ford's Magic Skyway, The Carousel of Progress, Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln, and It's a Small World. The story of the World's Fair projects are an episode unto themselves. It was a whole thing. So I'm going to gloss right over several spectacular years of interesting accounts and innovations and summarize it all by stating that Disney's technology and use of technology made enormous strides during the endeavor. 
With the extensive expansion of the R&D department and its newest division called MAPO, standing for Manufacturing and Production Organization, made with the intent purpose of meeting the production demand of the very hush-hush Disney World project, Walt had his newfound Imagineering headquarters, then called WED, right next door to the top-of-the-line first-class manufacturing and production facility. The stage was set for his next big attraction, literally an amalgam of all of the fantastic technology and design know-how they had learned and developed over the course of the World's Fair projects. It would have the flair of the Magic Skyway, as guests were transported past humorous, interacting audio animatronics. It would have the same heightened level of set design, staging, and backgrounds, with the fine-tuned attention to detail as the Carousel of Progress. It would utilize the home technology of the audio animatronics developed in the Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln attraction. Imagine it, an entire attraction of audio animatronic Lincolns! And guests would experience all of it within the safety of a boat, gently weaving through a canal while another world seemingly took place around them. Just as in, it's a small world. Its name? We call it the, uh, Blue Bayou Lagoon. Or the Blue Bayou Boat Ride, as it was called in those early days. Make it blue. How the news was broken to Mark Davis that the Wax Museum was to be left in the dust is anyone's guess. But given that he was pulled from his early pirate conceptualizations to work on the World's Fair projects, it's safe to assume he was excited by the change. His work up to this point wasn't at all wasted, but rather became the groundwork for an entirely larger project. After being put back to work on pirates, his conceptual drawings went to a whole other level. More artists were brought in, under Mark, to flesh out ideas and concepts he just no longer had the time to do himself. By the time the 64 World's Fair had wrapped up in 65, Disney was in full swing in creating Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, Walt when he saw a better way to do something, discard the old way. Walt decided within a year that he wanted it bigger than ever, so he added another show building, which, due to space restraints, meant it had to go beneath the berm surrounding Disneyland. It would also require the boats to go under Disneyland's train tracks, so the entire area that had been developed for the Wax Museum was completely dismantled, steel and all, to be redesigned as just the first phase of a colossal concept. No one even knew what to do with most of the first building, so Walt told Wed to just put in some caves or something, using the methods and tools they had developed in fashioning the caves for the Ford Magic Skyway. And this second building was necessary for the addition of a full-scale pirate ship, and part of a Spanish fort, Battle Bombardment. On the blast. Once it was decided that boats would be part of the pirate experience, Bob Gurr was brought in to redesign the boats he had fashioned for the 64 World Fair's It's a Small World attraction. So he had his hand in Pirates of the Caribbean, as well as so many other things. He's an incredible guy. I think I mention him in like every classic Disney attraction episode I make now. He's quoted as saying, if it moves on wheels at Disneyland, I probably designed it. Which is weird for me to mention in an episode involving boats, but there are technically guide wheels here and there in the canal, so there you go. But anyways, since the boats for It's a Small World were created by Arrow Development, the company was also used to make the boats for Pirates of the Caribbean. Arrow was also used to fashion the flume system for pirates for when you take those drops. He comes seeking adventure and salty old pirates, eh? Walt, Mark Davis, and some others even flew up to Arrow Development Headquarters to test out the boat in a flume mock-up in the fall of 64, which, despite Walt's serious face in these photos, appeared to be a very nice day for Mark Davis. Oh, look at that smile. That's a happy birthday smile. Dick Irvine executed the art direction on Pirates of the Caribbean. He was the first head of what is now known as Walt Disney Imagineering. Before working for Disney, he had a robust career in movie set design and all the technical aspects of the day. Which, when you understand that, it starts to make sense why Disney attractions are so often a cut above most of what you'll find at other theme parks. They've always used high-end movie set design, layout, and lighting, etc. for their attractions. And that started with Dick Irvine, who's ironically all the way in the back of this photo. He was hired not just to be in charge of certain projects or single attractions, but rather the Disneyland and Magic Kingdom parks as a whole. A lot of the design and forced perspective stuff within the parks is due to Irvine, and he personally did the art direction for Pirates in both Disneyland and the Magic Kingdom. 
Although Bill Martin is also credited for his hand in the art direction, and he was the art director of Disneyland's original Fantasyland, as well as contributing to the monorail, Sleeping Beauty Castle, Cinderella's Castle, Peter Pan's Flight, the Utilidors Beneath the Magic Kingdom, the entire layout of the Magic Kingdom itself. You get the idea. He was an Imagineer heavyweight. Now I, of course, can't tell you exactly what Bill Martin did for Pirates of the Caribbean, but I'm sure, given all of his credentials, it was nothing short of genius. I already mentioned that Claude Coates laid out the original Wax Museum, but his connection to Pirates of the Caribbean in no way ended there. He played a pivotal role in the creation of the attraction, essential in setting up, tailoring, and perfecting it too. After the boats were added, Claude went on to design and lay out the actual track pattern, utilizing all of the available space, just like he did on It's a Small World. Once this was done, around late 1966, he oversaw the production of the show models, literally building the attraction using Mark Davis's very thorough design work. Harriet Burns, one of the first three original Imagineers who designed the buildings for Disneyland, by the way. Oh, and she helped build the first model for Sleeping Beauty's castle. Anyway, Harriet actually created this long, intricate, and exact model layout for the entire ride, designed so someone could view the ride from the guest's perspective in a boat. The pirate models placed throughout were essential in tailoring and tweaking the attraction. Both Mark Davis and Walt Disney utilized this modeling method to hone the best possible staging for guests to enjoy. It was featured in Walt Disney's Wonderful World of Color, as well as some other promotional work. And you believe in pirates, of course. Oh, yes. Well, you want to see some? Love to. Right over here, we'll meet them. The full-scale figures and faces were created by Blaine Gibson, essentially the Disney sculptor at the time, in case the name doesn't ring a bell, and the modeling team at WED, WED standing for Walter Elias Disney, which is essentially what's called the Imagineering Department nowadays, and Blaine's modeling team, comprised of Peter Kermode and George Snowden. If I haven't been clear enough, some of the absolute best artists and Imagineers worked on Pirates. Mark Davis's pre-production work became instrumental to Blaine and his team. Blaine started by making maquettes of every figure, human, and animal. There are over 120, by the way. Nearly all of them from Mark's conceptual drawings as reference, which is a lot of hydraulics. Blaine Gibson made more than 30 different faces from his work studying Mark Davis's concepts, as well as one or two other inspirations I'll go over in just a bit. Anytime. After Blaine Gibson was done with the figures, they went to the capable hands of Leota Toombs, mostly known as the face of Madame Leota in the Haunted Mansion. But besides that, she was a truly amazing artist and Imagineer. On Pirates of the Caribbean, she mainly worked on forming, designing, and finishing work on the figures. Along with Harriet Burns, too, by the way. Alright, so it's impossible to explain the creation of Pirates of the Caribbean without bringing up Xavier Atencio, otherwise known as Ex Atencio. He was an Imagineer, but got his start as an in-betweener animator for Monstro and Pinocchio and moved up to assistant animator on Fantasia. Fast forward a number of years and he did some stop motion work on the toy soldiers in Babes in Toyland, and that resulted in him working on the toy soldiers in the parade at Disneyland, and before long he was moved over to be a full-time Imagineer in 1965. However, X hadn't done much as an Imagineer other than working on the dinosaurs for the primeval world diorama for the Disneyland Railroad, when Walt personally tasked him with scripting Pirates of the Caribbean. Now, X hadn't scripted anything in his life up to this point, by the way. Walt just sensed that X would be a good fit. The project was enormous and already well underway. His most talented artists had already put years into its production. The budget was well into the millions. This is in the 1960s, mind you. Promises had been made, hands had been shaken, the wonderful world of color had already aired. To put the script of such a gargantuan project into the hands of a completely untested artist, not even a writer, was an incredible gamble. And, uh, it turns out Walt was a visionary genius. All of X's work turned out to be a phenomenal hit. Even X didn't know what Walt saw in him, but it was something, and it paid off big. After X finished the script, he worked on the storyboards with Mark Davis. And in the midst of all of this craziness, X knew Pirates would need a song, so an idea struck him for a melody, and some lyrics, too. Again, never having written anything before, let alone lyrics, he scribbled them down and brought it up to Walt, figuring if he happened to like it, he would hand it off to some musicians like the Sherman Brothers. Instead, Walt Disney told him it was great and instructed him to get with George Bruns to do the music. Just like that, he was a songwriter, and now we all have Yo-Ho. 
Again, X had never written music in his life. I don't know what you're talking about. George Bruns, I should add, is best known for writing the ballad of Davy Crockett. However, Yo Ho Yo Ho was specifically worded to undercut the idea of hardened murderous criminals into charismatic, whimsical rascals, obviously inspired through Mark Davis's concept work. Without the song, they're just whimsically pillaging, torturing, and setting fires. X admitted that all he did was use the kind of dialogue Mark Davis's pirates may have spoken and put it to music. That simplicity, along with the musical talent of George Bruns, was all that was needed for a catchy tune that people still whistle to themselves over half a century later. Ex Atencio is also the voices for several characters on the ride. He's still the talking skull and crossbones, at Disneyland, mind you. And Davy Jones waiting for them what don't obey. <laughs> and was the voice for the skull at the Magic Kingdom until 2006. He's also the voice of the pirate whose foot is dangling overhead on the bridge, as well as several of the guys across from the redhead. Hey, be a scouter by the pound? Not only that, X also voice directed all of the other performers for all of the lines in Pirates, with a little help from Marty Sklar, an Imagineer powerhouse who went on to become the head of Disney Imagineering. But that's a whole other story. Did I mention X didn't have any experience at any of this kind of stuff? I really feel I need to stress that. Though I need to add that Marty Sklar worked out the timing for Pirates and proposed dialogues throughout the attraction, in a way working under Exitensio. Everything about X and his involvement with Pirates is upside down. Okay, so X's Yo-Ho song was performed by the Mellow Men, which was a quartet group founded by Thurl Ravenscroft, a huge Disney name that I've mentioned in other episodes. I'm Thurl Ravenscroft and I sort of carry along on the bottom end. <laughs> Thurl, coincidentally, voiced the accordion-playing pirate, the pirate who once balanced atop the dynamite barrel, and was in fact the voice for the singing howling dog. If you don't recognize his name, he was an amazing voice actor with a laundry list of credits, including Tony the Tiger. They're great! The Mellow Men were such a perfect choice for pirates, it just makes the ride all the more iconic. They worked on a number of Disney movies and shorts. They did the Three Little Pigs, the Elephants in the Jungle Book, as well as being the singing bus in the Haunted Mansion. They weren't attached to Disney's hip though. They also performed with Bing Crosby, Doris Day, and even Elvis, to name drop a few others. There were a bunch of neat people who did voices for pirates. Paul Fries, who was the ghost host voice in the Haunted Mansion. Oh, I didn't mean to frighten you prematurely. <laughs> was the voice of the auctioneer. And now you bilge rats, do I hear six? Who makes it six? As well as some other pirates. And incidentally, Ludwig von Drake. <laughs> How do you like that? I thought it was a motorcycle coming at me, and it was the spotlight was hitting me because I'm the professor going to give a lecture. <laughs> J. Pat O'Malley, who was the voice of Colonel Hathi in the Jungle Book, also did voices for several pirates. Oh. Well, where was I? Oh, yes, Inspector. <clears throat> the magistrate's wife, who says, Be brave, Carlos. Don't listen to him. Was done by June Foray, who also did the voices for Grandma Fa and Mulan. This cricket's a lucky one. Talking Tina in the Twilight Zone. My name is Talking Tina, and I'm beginning to hate you. And Magica Dispel in DuckTales. There is only room in this world for one Magica Dispel. So after Mark Davis conceptualized the pirates, they were passed on to Blaine Gibson to make the models, then went to Leota Toombs to do the finishing work. Finally, they went to Alice Davis for costuming, who just so happened to be Mark Davis's wife. Anyway, Alice manufactured all of the original costumes and pirates, strictly following Mark Davis's designs. Not merely the wife of an incredible artist, Alice Davis easily stood on her own merits. Walt had a very favorable view of her after her work on It's a Small World. Especially after he saw that Alice had garnered a very high regard by Mary Blair, the designer of It's a Small World. Being so esteemed by two such undeniably talented artists as Mark Davis and Mary Blair, Walt decided to put Alice in charge of the costuming for Pirates, and it was yet another decision that proved he had a keen insight and intuition. Alice spoke about this time period as difficult, Relatively new to Disney and working in the center of the model shop, surrounded by a small crew of scrutinizing eyes. But she persevered and put in her best effort. 
She was outright told not to focus on the lining because the coats didn't need to look good, but she would argue that they would last longer. The audio animatronics were intended to run for hours a day, every day, for years, which of course was going to wear out the fabric, and such dedication added to the overall success of the attraction. She designed and created 47 costumes for Pirates of the Caribbean. She had told higher-ups that she believed each animatronic needed a backup, but was told not to create them because they were on a large yet fairly tight budget. And they said, oh, we, can't, we don't have the time. We have to have just one costume as quick as can be. Well, you can cut two out at the same time you cut one. Now, Alice had worked on her own lines of fashion and made costumes for television for over a decade at this point, so she knew it was a ridiculous call. So then, several months after Pirates opened, there was a fire, oddly enough, in the fire scene. Yeah, go figure. I've heard it told two different ways. In one version, it was a mild fire that was fairly harmless with some cosmetic damage. In the other, it burned a couple of the figures like something out of an 80s horror film. Faces melted, wires and metal instead of human tissue, that sort of thing. Nevertheless, Alice asked Dick Irvine, you may recall I mentioned him earlier. Anyway, Dick Irvine was the one who handedly denied her budget for duplicates of all the costumes, apparently having smugly told her that if and when they needed duplicates at some later point, they would just worry about it then. So, Alice went ahead and lied when asked how much material she would need to complete the project for the Pirates Attraction wardrobe. She doubled the amount and made two of every costume anyway. She even got a carpenter to make her a secret cabinet where she stored them. Nobody was the wiser. That was until the fire. Dick Irvine, of course, ran over to Alice in an emotional state because of the fire damage and all, and asked how long it would take to remake the costumes, because they couldn't reopen the ride unless the pirates were, you know, clothed. Alice answered that the hats alone would take weeks, to which Dick replied something along the lines of, That long? Alice told Dick she had gone ahead and made two of every costume in spite of his direct refusal, and told him she could get the costumes to him in half an hour. Apparently, his face belied his confusion whether to hit her or hug her. Strange times the 60s. I hear they currently keep three sets of costumes for every figure now. Anyway, the attraction was up and running 24 hours after the fire. Alice Davis humbly refused to take credit for the design of the costumes, claiming they all came from Mark's concept design work. Occasionally, she would have to redesign a costume to fit a tricky situation. Such is a situation where she repeatedly told the modeling team that gentlemen dressed themselves to the right or the left, but the modelers continually refused to listen to what she was saying, and kept on sculpting the bodies as though they would be standing nude. This culminated to an ordeal with the auctioneer, who wears a long vest down to his knees. When the auctioneer says, What be I offered for this winsome wench? He leans back, and so, because none of the modelers listen that a gentleman dresses himself to the right or the left, the auctioneer's whole crotch rose up to his vest, repeatedly. So they had to tear the whole figure down, and the modelers then understood what Alice meant that a gentleman dresses himself to the left or the right. It's a cool story, right? She tells it much better. It's embarrassing. <laughs> The original redhead in the auction scene was also a problem Alice had to tackle. From the area below her bust to her hips, there was apparently only a two-inch tube holding her upright. Alice's job was to dress this hollow body, so she came up with the idea of making a special stiff corset that attached just below the bust to the top of the hips to give her a shape, but it was always kept hollow within. Alice well understood, especially from discussions with Mark Davis, that with costuming or anything else on such attractions, it's all about the illusion of what the audience sees. In the early days after its opening, it was actually Alice's job, along with her team of costumers, to go to the Pirates of the Caribbean attraction every morning to check and adjust the costumes and wigs, as well as apply makeup and powder to each figure to help make them realistic. <laughs> Did you think it was real? It looks so real! Now, it's said that John Hench had a big role in the art direction, but I'm a little skeptical. I don't mean to besmirch John Hench, he's a legend in his own right, but I own and have read his book, and there's not a single word about his role in Pirates of the Caribbean. From the narratives, I've only heard him dismissing the attraction, saying the connection and wafting past the Blue Bayou restaurant is strange and doesn't make any sense, so I have no idea to what extent John Hench played. Yale Gracie, on the other hand, played a great role in creating pirates. He was yet another animator turned Imagineer. 
Though given his skill with special effects, they actually called him an illusioner during his time. And he did an outstanding job for the special effects in Pirates. To even halfway explain what he pulled off would take way too long for an episode like this. But considering that he did it all without the use of video images is really saying something. His lighting work on Pirates is subtly brilliant, adding yet another layer of depth and dimension that's easy to take for granted. Another artist would have made the lighting starker or even brighter for guests to see more, which would have changed the tone entirely. Yale Gracie is also responsible for the storm effects of the skeleton helmsman, cloud projections, the moonlit lighting of the blue bayou along with its original fireflies, and perhaps most importantly, the flames of the burning city. The effects of these flames were surreal for their time, so intense that the fire marshal made Disney install emergency shutoff switches to the effects. One, in case people began to panic because they believed the flames were actually real, and two, in case there ever was a real fire and firemen needed to know which fire was real. There was even a divide between the Imagineering team as a whole, whether the flames were too intense or a step too far, or just simply amazing. Some actually thought the flames were too edgy. Okay, fine, fine, I'm cool, I'm fine. I'm not adding hidden Mickeys or anything in this episode, but a fun detail is Walt Disney and Roy Disney's initials set into the wrought iron fence of the balcony. The area up there was intended to be a 3,000 square foot apartment for Walt and his family, called the Disneyland Dream Suite. Now as you board your boat, you'll see a sign reading Lafitte's Landing, the only reference to an actual pirate on the attraction. And it does make sense, because he has historical ties to the New Orleans theme. He assisted Andrew Jackson in the Battle of New Orleans. Not only that, the whole exterior facade was inspired by the Cabildo building in Jackson Square in New Orleans. This structure stood as the epicenter of Spanish rule over New Orleans for more than 50 years and was where the Louisiana Purchase was signed, doubling the size of the United States. The Louisiana Purchase was probably the greatest real estate deal of all time. Every scene for Pirates of the Caribbean was given its own special flair. It's what makes the ride so enthralling. Each of them is filled with a myriad of things going on, and you only have so long to look and listen that you totally become absorbed in what's going on. And that's no accident. Even the caves, which seem so simple, were well thought out. Mark Davis purposely designed the bayou with an atmospheric sense of mystery, the stillness working almost as though a palate cleanser from the busyness of Disneyland, as well as for what's to come. Suitably lulled by the quietude, you're gradually closed in, creating a sense of foreboding as you approach the dark tunnel and drop. There's so many rumors about the skull over the bed that it may as well have its own episode, but I'm gonna lay them all out here. People believe the skull and several skeletons are real human bones, that Walt Disney wanted and actually got real skeletons for the attraction. Then there's the rumor that over the years things were replaced during refurbishments, and that now only a few skeletons are real, including the skull on the headboard. Then there are rumors that only the skull is real. Then there are rumors that none of the rumors are true. Disney has never confirmed or denied any of the rumors, and I have no clue, so I don't even have two cents to put in here. I can't believe it! I just don't believe it! Now one of the bigger technical problems with the attraction was to minimize the splash at the bottom of the water drops. Every modification made to the boat resulted in adjustments either to the boat guide system, the boat itself, or elsewhere, making for a long and slow tinkering process, but eventually resulted in a dependably dry attraction. The scale, colors, and wide scope as you wind the turn into the cacophonous bombarding the fort scene was all intended to jar the senses of guests as they're suddenly confronted by a whole ship and sizable fort with audio animatronics yelling and firing at one another. According to Mark Davis, this really did stun and excite people, but has generally become taken for granted decades after the fact. Ka-chow. <laughs> The well scene was one of the extremely rare instances where an Imagineer's original design remained the exact same until the completion, revealing just how great Mark Davis's concepts were. The dialogue, the character design, the clothes, set design, there was nothing to improve upon, nothing that anyone could think of to make it better. It passed through dozens of other talented people's hands, such as machinists, sculptors, animators, fashion design, you name it, and not a single noteworthy change. It's really an enormous testament to Mark Davis's skill and the attraction itself overall. And just a neat side note, the Magistrate's shirt has a wash of mineral oil to make it look as though it's perpetually wet. 
I don't know how they cover up the smell. That stuff is potent. The auctioneer was added late to the attraction, and yet it was the headlining scene for the Imagineering team. The auctioneer was the most sophisticated audio animatronic up to the point when Pirates of the Caribbean was released. He had more moves, a stronger lip sync, and tons of small quirky variations. A leap from the Abraham Lincoln animatronic that was released only several years earlier. Near the auctioneer is the redhead. It kind of made me sad that people so hotly debated the change of the redhead back in June of 2018. Because according to Claude Coates, who by the way passed away in 1992, so this reveal happened decades ago, he said even Walt Disney himself openly voiced concerns about whether the auctioning of brides fit into the Disney Park brand. And though they obviously went through with making the scene, Walt nonetheless held doubts about whether it should have been made. I mean, I like the old way because that was what I was used to, but I also thought the redhead being a pirate was also a neat idea and it wasn't unfounded given some of Mark Davis's concept work. But once I heard that Walt Disney had his reservations, it just made sense that the ride changed with the times, like Walt said the park should. Though I want to add that Mark Davis was amused that someone thought that chickens would somehow lighten up a scene involving the selling off of women. One of the things Walt personally asked for early on regarding Pirates of the Caribbean was for a scene of some sort where the pirates are sacking a city. So right from the beginning, as far back as the Wax Museum phase, there was a scene with a raging fire. I already went over the effects for the fire in Yale Gracie, but the fact that this is merely the backdrop for a scene is just an astounding level of detail that even current Disney rides don't bother to incorporate. I still don't understand why Frozen doesn't have snow, by the way. Originally, pirates chased all of the women in circles. At the time, I suppose it was humorous. However, Mark did actually conceptualize one woman chasing away a pirate which Disney eventually used for one of the circling chases, which was funny, before changing all of them to women chasing men, which is a bit less funny. And I know funny. I'm a clownfish. The dungeon is perhaps the most iconic scene in Pirates of the Caribbean, perhaps because it is a perfect example of staging and utilizing space, not to mention the universal appeal of the gag. But an interesting thing about the man with the rope is that it was modeled after a janitor at Wet Enterprises. Only one pirate was confirmed to be inspired by a real person, just one. The janitor's name was John. He apparently was a funny short guy people called Big John, and this is what he looked like. Though I found a website saying the minstrel in the middle here is also Big John. It's also said that the auctioneer's face was inspired by the famous Imagineer, Raleigh Crump, who unfortunately passed away fairly recently. Though Blaine Gibson refused to reveal whether it really was Raleigh Crump, you can kind of see the exaggerated resemblance to the original auctioneer to Raleigh if you imagine him without his beard or hat. There are several other unconfirmed individuals being inspirations for pirates. Blaine Gibson supposedly told someone that he saw a rotund gentleman at a restaurant one night and that he thought he would be perfect for a drunk scene. So he stared at the guy all night while his wife continually kicked and scolded him for staring, which could be true. There's also claims that several pirates were faces Blaine Gibson sketched while at church. But whether true or not, most of the faces came from Mark Davis's drawings. Several of the heads Blaine made were repurposed and eventually made their way into other attractions over the course of the next 20 years. For instance, the man in the chair outside of the shack across from the Blue Bayou restaurant has the same face as the pirate standing in the jail cell trying to get the keys from the dog. The man circling in the Haunted Mansion ballroom has the same face as the original auctioneer. Big John's face is the same as the ghost blowing out the candles in the same ballroom scene. And Big John is supposedly the same face used in the Haunted Mansion's graveyard scene, for both the bagpipe and flute players. There's possibly more, but I'm trying to focus on Disneyland's Pirates of the Caribbean here. And websites and YouTube videos continually mix it up with the Magic Kingdoms. That sound about right. Pirates of the Caribbean opened on March 18, 1967. The Blue Bayou restaurant opened with the attraction on March 18th as well. However, what's not as well known is that Walt originally intended pirates to be part of the dining experience, which apparently didn't turn out so well during a dress rehearsal. And apparently, the Blue Bayou restaurant was up and ready to go months before Pirates was ready. Yet Walt refused to open its doors because he felt both the attraction and restaurant were part of the same experience. Unfortunately, Walt never got to see Pirates of the Caribbean completed. 
He died just three months beforehand, while the kinks with the auctioneer scene were being ironed out. But for all intents and purposes, and given how much work he personally poured into its creation, it can easily be said that it was the last ride with his stamp of approval. Well, it seemed almost all of it. It just wasn't installed and, and it wasn't working. And if the numbers are any indication, it is still the most popular attraction Disney has ever produced. It's the pinnacle of Disney magic, as though all the stars aligned. Walt worked on it himself. The original and best Disney Imagineers, art directors, costume designers, sculptors and artists all had their hands in its creation. The money was there to be used. The tune continues to unflinchingly withstand the test of time. Even the smell has a magical kind of quality, which I quickly want to add, Morton Co.'s Water of the Caribbean candle is their biggest selling item on Etsy and captures the essence of the ride. I think I've bought Waters of the Caribbean like four times now. It's well worth the money and often on sale. Anyway, Marty Sklar was quoted as saying that Pirates of the Caribbean broke the mold. It created a genre that was so new that everything else that follows has to be measured against it, which is still true over half a century of entertaining guests. Pirates of the Caribbean was a totally new thing when it debuted. People outside of those who attended the 64 World's Fair had never seen an audio animatronic, and here was a very long, elaborate, one-of-a-kind showcase. It was something everyone had to see. Marty kind of said it all by stating, the one constant at Disneyland is change, and the attraction has had some changes over the years, but it kept the spirit and values that Walt envisioned. Smart guy, Marty. I thought it fitting to end this episode quoting a guy who contributed to scripting the attraction, so I'm going to stop talking now. Hit the like and subscribe, and thanks for watching and listening. Diz Fair is out.